Hi, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Burl Mostel. We're at Villa Catalana Cellars uh, in Canby. Uh, it's July 20th, 2018, and Burl, we're going to start you off by asking you why wine? Well, that's a good question. Um, actually, I've been drinking wine for, what, 40 years? <laughs> 45 years? <laughs> And I've always been interested in wine, actually even before it was legal, but I, of course, never drank any before, <laughs> but I was interested. Um, and, um, and so um, then in 2008, just on a whim, uh, a friend of mine who has a couple of restaurants in Lake Oswego, he, he's into wine too, and we said, hey, let's make some Pinot Noir. And so we bought some grapes from a neighbor a couple miles down the road and made Pinot Noir, and the first... Um, uh, car, it was just carboy wine, so it was like 15 or 20 gallons. The first um, uh, one was actually pretty good. The second one was okay, and the third one was terrible. <laughs> and I learned from that, the terrible one is we left it on the leads too long, got all these off flavors and smells and everything. And so, and so then the next year, he didn't want to do it. And I thought, well, I still want to do it. And that really was probably the, the crucial thing because I went back to the, to the vineyard owner and see if he had some grapes. And he said, no, all my grapes are, are spoken for. I don't have any. And so, um, so I thought, well, I'm not going to be able to make any wine this year. And I happened to be at, uh, at Bridgeport um, Wine and Beer Supplies in Oregon City and was telling him, oh, you know, I really want to uh, make wine this year, but I can't find any grapes. And he goes, well, here, this guy's got grapes. He's down near Molala. So I call him up and he says, oh, well, no, I'm out of grapes, but my neighbor has some grapes. And so we went over there, and you probably remember 2009 was not a very good year, and I was picking in the rain, and, um, and it, it was just, you know, well, ended up that the wine that I made was so good, we didn't even bottle it. We drank it all before we got it bottled. <laughs> and so all of a sudden I went, oh, the secret to making good wine is good grapes. You start with good grapes, and unless you screw it up, it's going to be good wine. Um, and so, um, so then that was the sort of the beginning process of like, well, you know, maybe I really could learn how to be a winemaker, especially if you start with good grapes, then it's not so hard. <laughs> um, and so the next uh, part of it was convincing my wife that we should do this. And um, our idea was um, you know, to be really small. I should say my idea, it wasn't her idea yet, to be really small and I could make a number of uh, pieces of equipment because we all know that you know if you start a winery it's a big money pit and people can spend hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, million dollars getting started sure. and we just didn't have that money and we didn't want to do it that way anyway and so our goal was just to be really small and so um, so it ended up that 2012 was our uh, first official um, vintage. And that was from the grapes from the fellow that I had gotten from uh, near Molala uh, back in 2009 for the first time. And then we, um, we also did a Pinot Gris. We did a, um, a Syrah that we got grapes up from Washington. Mm -hmm. And then um, we also made what we call our fortified wine liqueur. And it's a, a kind of an experiment that we did um, Oh, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, my wife and I started uh, making liqueurs. And we made about, oh, probably a dozen different berry type liqueurs, all the way from black cap to raspberry to huckleberry, and even made a mango one, which was not very good. <laughs> uh, but it was funny because we went to this, um, uh, to this um, uh, farmer who had uh, you pick, and so we told him what we were doing, and we were looking for black caps because I grew up in Oregon, and I remember black cap jam as a kid and how wonderful it tastes and I thought oh this is going to make the best liqueur. Well he told us about Cascade Berry and we went Cascade Berry what's that? And he says well there's a few left over there they ripen earlier why don't you try it? So we picked some and we made a liqueur from that and it was hands down the best liqueur of all the ones we ever made. And so we remembered that and when we started a winery we said okay let's do this this fortified wine liqueur and because you know you're uh, now a licensed winery you have to have all the um, uh, meet all the requirements of TTB and so um, so we had to modify the recipe. It took me about six months of making it back and forth to make sure it was like what it was originally. And so, so that was this long story short, uh, or, or short story long. I'm not sure. Uh, it was um, uh, that was well also a, a wine that we or a liqueur that we made in 2012. Sure. And so then by um, 2014, we actually opened and. Um, and we entered the Cascade Berry and our Pinot Noir and the San Francisco Chronicle taste, and we both won gold medals. And so I went, oh, our first vintage, hmm, this isn't, this, I think we're on the right track here. Sure, sure. So that's how it got started. The other thing, um, uh, you haven't seen it yet, but uh, we have a, um, 
we built this uh, this um, building. Uh, the interior was going to be a big courtyard for tropical plants. Okay. And so um, during the process of trying to formulate Starlin wine, we realized we could convert that. Just put a bar in there, we'd have our tasting room. And so it was like, oh, we don't have to, you know, build a separate building or do a whole bunch of things um, that most wineries have to do because we can just do that right here. Sure. And so that's how it all got started. So why don't you back up, let's back up a little bit and talk mm -hmm. about this property mm -hmm. and how you got here and all of this. I know you have a, a back up with plants, so mm -hmm. we'll talk, let's talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, well, we bought this property in 2004, and uh, our interest at that point was we lived in Portland on an acre and a half. We had a nursery that I started back in 1987, and we were wanting to expand the nursery and also um, build our dream house. And so we looked for property for two years. and never found anything. Um, well, we found one property that we found at the at, right at the beginning. Um, it was five acres is what we were looking for. And um, and the fellow was a family friend. And, and so he says, well, you're going to be able to find something better. So we kept looking. And finally, and we didn't. And so finally went back to him after two years and said, well, we're interested in buying your property. And he says, well, let me check with my brother. I'm almost sure he doesn't want this property, but I should check because he's family. So he checked and he calls me up and says, I'm really sorry, but he wants to buy the property and build a house for his kids. And we went, oh. well, so we happened to be driving by this property uh, and there was a sign it was in, um, in uh, probate and we saw it and it was just a hay field. There were no trees. We were looking actually for a, um, uh, like a, um, uh, an old uh, farmhouse that was tear down, but moved some good buildings, uh, farm buildings and some old trees. But we never found that in looking for two years. And so, um, so we looked at this, we didn't like it. You know, it was just a hay field, there were no trees. And so, you know, we kind of forgot about it. And like a month later, my wife goes, well, we should go back and look at that. We haven't found anything any better. So we went back and then started looking a little more closely. And we started realizing, well, you know, there was some potential here. It wasn't what we wanted, but we haven't found what we wanted anyway. And so we put an offer on it and we got it. Um, and you probably know with Oregon, uh, they have really strict land use laws in terms of building on agriculture land. And so um, we had to qualify. You have to make $80,000 a year for, and two years in a row in agriculture before they will allow you, uh, grant you a permit to build. We had no problem with that. All we had to do is move our nursery over here because we've been doing that, more than that on an acre and a half. And so we moved that and then in 2000 and, um, uh, seven, we got our permit and started building here. Um, now, our inspiration for this place was a 12th century church in Catalonia in the Pyrenees Mountains. Um, and so we'd actually looked for several years trying to find a picture of a house that we liked that we could take to a um, um, an architect mm -hmm. and say, hey, this is what we want. You know, we would design all the interior, um, you know, stuff, but this is what it looked, wanted to look like on the outside. Well. We never found a picture. I mean, we looked forever. We even subscribed to Country Life, which is an English manor publication that comes every week. You know, it's like $300 a year came every week, had all these pictures of English manor gardens that were for sale and so forth. And so then finally, um, we knew that we wanted either an English Tudor style or Romanesque style. And so because years ago, I'd visited Europe and just fell in love with uh, medieval architecture. and so. So uh, we were at, uh, at uh, went, middle of winter, went to Powell's book, started looking through the architecture de uh, department, found this one book on Romanesque architecture, and I was flipping through it and I found this picture of this church, uh, San, Cl San Clemente de Tawil. It's in the Pyrenees, and uh, we went, this is what we want. This is exactly what we want. It's not exactly what we wanted to, we, we didn't want it to look like a church, so it took six months or a year working with the architect until we came up with this design that shows the inspiration from San Clemente. Um, and so that's how it, how it started. And then in 2007, uh, we started building and then um, we um, moved in in uh, August of 2008. So it took us a little over a year uh, to build. And we did all the work ourselves. I had about um, three or four guys that, that helped me. And the only thing we didn't do was the roof, the interior framing, and the sheetrock. Other than that, electrical, plumbing, stonework, we did it all. Amazing. So, and that was the way we could afford it. Otherwise, we never would have been able to afford to build this place. Um, so that's what shows what shows to go you. If you uh, put your mind to it and you really work hard, you can create something that maybe normally you couldn't afford. Sure. Um, so that's kind of the, the the history of that part. So once you had it, once you had it built, and, mm -hmm. and you're getting into wine, you decided to make it your tasting room as well. Mm -hmm. Tell us about sort of 
what your inspiration was in terms of what did you hope people would get out of it? What were you kind of hoping to host here? What, you know, what, mm -hmm. was, what was the idea behind using the property? Sure. Well, um, originally when we built the house, we weren't, of course, planning on um, on a, a, you know winery at all. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if we would have, we would have done a few things differently. Not a whole lot, but a few things differently. Mm -hmm. uh, but the idea was um, to um, uh, create a lot of really nice gardens uh, that would inspire people. Um, and so, um, for instance, at our old place in Portland, it was a, a fairly small garden, but um, it w people would come and they would get inspired. They would feel good. They would people want to have weddings in our backyard and mm -hmm. things like that. And we realized, well, this is really important. We thought, well, this would be not only good for our enjoyment, but be for for the enjoyment for other people, but also would help sell our nursery plants. Um, and so that's how it started. And then um, I guess it was about two thousand and. Eight, um, we uh, it, the, the 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 economy went south, of course, with the with the Great Recession and so forth, and so nursery sales dropped, and so we said, well, we need to do something other than opening our nursery. We'd open it uh, two times a year to the public. The rest of the time it was wholesale, mm -hmm. um, and so we got the idea of holding a little jazz concert here. And so I think the first one we had like 50 people and we had um, a chef come and do dinner and, and then it gradually built over the years. And then when we started the winery, it really started building. And so now we have um, lunches once a month and we have dinners in the summer and typically have about 200 people that come uh, for those uh, events. And now we're expanded even to, you know, some uh, um, Renaissance music and some, we're doing a chamber music concert for the first time this year and a variety of things like that. Um, and so that's kind of how it evolved in, in that regard. And it was, um, and really starting the winery too was partly out of just hoping that we could augment our um, uh, income because of the income from the nursery dropping so much. Sure. Um, and sure. so, and it went beyond our wildest dreams. <laughs> but the other thing about um, what we've come uh, to learn um, is that um, uh, as we built the gardens and more people came, people would get inspired. And we realized that inspiration is really um, important for, for people um, and their lives. And um, I was a clinical psychologist for 20 years, practiced in Portland uh, for 20 years, and I retired from that, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago now. And of course, in, in that uh, occupation, you're, you're, um, you know, you're always talking about people's problems, you're trying to work out whatever the issues are, so a person can have a better life. Sure. Well, one of the things that I learned coming here is you're not talking about people's problems here now, but they get inspired and we've seen people come um, that are um, in a bad mood and turn into to a good mood. Um, we've had people come and um, and actually have started crying because they, they felt uh, so good about the beauty and so forth here. Um, and so uh, we realized that, um, that that was something that was more valuable than, than any sort of income that we could uh, get from it. And so that's actually become kind of an inspiration for us too because to see other people inspired helps, you know, it, it sort of makes it not only um, good for your own inspiration, but also the good feelings that people have when they tell you how much they appreciate what you've done and so forth, you know. So, um, so that's kind of what happened, but I should say it, it didn't start with some big master plan. It just started, uh, I can't think like, I can't think of like a huge picture and okay, okay, we're gonna do this over here and this over here. Uh, it's just one thing led to another. So for instance, when we first bought the property, we were sitting, this was actually a slope here before we excavated it. Um, and I w we were sitting there, my wife and I were looking, I said, wouldn't it be neat if we could build, a, dig a pond here? So the house would kind of overlook a pond. And that was the first inspiration. And so we got a hold of the water master and we worked it out so we could get a permit and so forth. And we, that was the first pond. And then of course we had two other ponds since then. But one thing sort of led to another. And so what you have is a series of inspirations happen over 10 years. Sure. Um, sure. And like you said, I imagine the, the reactions from people kind of drive you to have more of those inspirations. If people are having such a good time and enjoying it here, you're like, what can we do to make it even better? That's exactly right. And then we also visit another a lot of gardens. We visit a lot of wineries, both in California and Europe and, and Oregon, and always looking for ideas to steal, you know? <laughs> I mean, because, you know, or and a lot of times, uh, well, like you didn't 
probably you drove past it, but there's a garden in the front that the inspiration was um, the Brazilian uh, gardener, uh, or I should say um, landscape architect, um, Roberto Burley Marx. It was an ins his, my inspiration, excuse me, his inspiration uh, became my inspiration in terms of a garden that he had done called um, the Var Garden of Volumes. And so that Garden of Volumes, I just love that garden. It's primarily a bromeliad garden. And so that went through me and it came out as this boulder garden. And if I didn't tell you that it was inspir inspired by Roberto Burley Marx, you would not know. Sure, sure. <laughs> and we have a really loud uh, blackbird here. <laughs> he likes to whistle. A little background noise for yeah. our show. <laughs> So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, tell us about the name Villa Catalana and where, where you came up with it and why you chose it. Well, um, we actually um, uh, came up with we uh, a friend of ours who has um, uh, a nursery up in Vancouver, Washington, or excuse me, Vancouver, BC. Um, um, said, hey, you should name your garden. And we thought, this was long before we started a, um, uh, the winery. And we thought about, oh, that's kind of pretentious, you know. And so we kept, then but he kept insisting, and finally we started going, well, the gardens by that time were large enough. And so we thought, okay. So we started thinking of different names. And since our inspiration was a church in Catalonia, we said, why don't we name it Villa Catalana? And so that's how the name came up. And then when we became a winery, it just became pretty easy just to add cellars to it. <laughs> so that was kind of a natural thing now. Let's talk about the wine a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you you talked about the kind of the different varietals you make. Mm -hmm. I know you're, and, you're, and you're a small winery. Mm -hmm. Have you, is this kind of what you want to be? Have you got plans to change anything in terms of winemaking? Yeah, um, we're, um, our, our grapes are now finally ready. This year will be the, will be the second year. Last, last year there wasn't much to, to pick, but um, this year we'll be doing all of our Pinot Gris from our vines and some of our Pinot Noir. Um, but, um, but what we're doing is really where we want to be. Um, we're only open um, Saturday, Saturday afternoons. And now we're getting so many people. Sometimes we get a hundred people in three, we're only open three hours on Saturday and we'll get like a hundred people show up and we're really busy, you know, when we do that. Um, and other people go, well, why don't you open on Sunday too? Wineries are open on Sunday too. And my wife and I just want to keep it small and we don't want to grow. Uh, we um, we do um, less than 500 cases a year, and it all is sold from here. Every once in a while, a restaurant will buy some of the wine, but. Um but we really, um, we're not interested in, in becoming big. We're not interested in the distributor, you know, and, and going that route. Uh, and we really think that for Oregon, um, that really the, the value is in small wineries. Mm -hmm. I mean, big wineries have a place too. I don't want to say uh, they don't, but in terms of if people want to come for a personalized experience of wine tasting and enjoying, in our case, enjoying, um, you know, a, a summer afternoon or in the wintertime in the conservatory, an area of tropical plants while uh, sipping wine, it's like that's a lot more of, a, of an enjoyable experience than going to the grocery store and buying a bottle of wine and go home and having it for dinner, you know, which is important too, because we all do that. <laughs> Um, so that's um, that's kind of a little bit more about uh, what we're uh, trying to do. Um, and so what I did uh, when we first started, I start, was on a quest actually to find um, the best grapes I could find. And most of them uh, that I found came from fairly small uh, vineyards. Um, and so like the first, um, the first um, Syrah that I made came from um, a Prosser, Washington. Mm -hmm. And uh, 2012 was not a very good year. It was a good year for Pinot Noir, but not a good year for um, uh, um, you know, for hot um, uh, climate grapes. Um, and so the straw I made was okay, but nothing special. And um, then the next year I experimented and I found a, a, a little winery east of the Dalles on the Washington side. And I tried their Syrah and it was so much better. Of course the year was better too. And so then I started experimenting. They did a um, raised Grenache grapes. And so I thought, well, back, this was back in 2013. I said, well, why don't we try to make a rosé? I mean, rosé during that time was like, oh, nobody drinks rosé, right. you know? But I remember being in Sonoma uh, earlier that year and I tasted a um, Sangiovese uh, rosé and I said, if I could make a rosé like that, I would make a rosé. And so I found this guy because he grew Sangiovese. And so um, 
but when I called him up, he says, oh, our Sanjay vase is all spoken for, but we have Grenache. And I thought, oh, I really wanted to make it out of Grenache. Well, of course, Grenache is, the, is a classic grape for a, uh, a um, um, you know, rosé from Provence. And so I thought, okay, I'll try it. Well, it ends up that during the summertime, the Grenache rosé is our best seller. Uh, we call it our summer picnic wine. It's light, it's fruity. Um, this year, it has just a little bit of residual sugar, um, and it's on a hot summer day. It's like, you can't think of a better thing to have to sip, you know? Um, so that's kind of how it, it, it started, and then I gradually um, looked for more and more um, um, vineyards so we could expand, and so in... Um, and I tried some grapes from Southern Oregon. Again, it wasn't a very good year. It was a long ways to go to get grapes. Um, then uh, in 2013, um, I found um, a fellow uh, oh, about 20 miles west of Pendleton uh, that, has, uh, that was growing uh, Cabernet, mm -hmm. uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. And so uh, then I talked to some other winemakers and they said, oh, his grapes are the best. The people that buy them here in the Willamette Valley. And so I arranged, actually it took me six months to find the guy because um, there was an article by a wine writer in the Oregonian that would have been in probably 2012, that they said this was the most expensive wine made in Oregon. You know, from grapes in Oregon, sure. and it was $125 a bottle, and it was it was a custom crush operation. The person that was marketing it didn't make the wine at all. I'm not sure who the winemaker was, and but they um, they gave me the or there was it was a mention of the vineyard name, and so um, so I searched and searched, searched, eventually found the vineyard, emailed them, emailed, no response, no response, call and call, no response. Finally, after I think about six months, they returned my call, and they went, oh yeah, we can sell you some grapes. <laughs> so it was like, oh. Well, so we just bottled our 2013 Cabernet uh, last fall, and it won a bronze medal at the San Francisco Chronicle tasting this last um, January. And um, besides the Grenache Rosé, it's probably our most popular wine. Uh, not many people do Cabernet around here. We're actually going to double our production this year for Cabernet because people just, they just love it. And one of the things that I've, we've noticed um, that we, uh, just over the last year or two, is that when we get a lot of people from out of state coming uh, to, to visit us. Mm -hmm. um, we've had people as far away as Barcelona and Toulouse to Texas and the East Coast and California and so forth. But the local people are sort of tired of Pinot Noir because, you know, we go to a lot of wineries and they have like, Four varieties are four different lots of Pinot Noir. And they're like, well, you know, I want something different. We're finding out that a lot of people want, um, they like Pinot, but they also want a full-bodied red. Sure. Um, in fact, it was back when I first started drinking wine back in the 70s. I remember that um, women didn't drink wine unless it was, um, what was it, Pink Chablis you know, with lots of sugar. And guys liked, if they drank wine at all, they liked, you know, Cabernet and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. you know, full-bodied reds. Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny, but what we've found in the last, I don't know how many years, is that there are more women that come wine tasting than men, and they like full-bodied reds. Mm -hmm. I mean, they like Pinots too, but it's really interesting how that whole, to me, the whole, um, sort of what people like has sort of shifted. My wife prefers uh, full-bodied um, reds over Pinot Noir, and personally, I like Pinot Noir the best. And it's like, well, this is interesting how people's tastes change and develop and so forth. And so, um, so anyway, that's kind of um, uh, how we are doing uh, a lot of our grapes that we can't grow here. So I'm curious, when you started, were there people who helped you with winemaking or sp there specifics of grape growing? Were the people you leaned on? Or yeah. Um, actually, uh, Chris Carlberg at Christopher Bridge, he um, gave me a lot of a lot of hints. He first told me about um, a, you know a cold soak, uh, and uh, and then I delved into it and started uh, reading a lot, got a lot of books, and um, and so um, so it was you know really a mostly self-taught. Uh, but then uh, there's also been a series of of webinars that I've been um, um, hooked up to put up by the Italian. Um, 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 uh, company Ernardis, mm -hmm. and that I've been learning a lot of things that are relatively new. Mm -hmm. um, like I've learned about Cheetosan. I didn't know anything about that. It's a broad spectrum antimicrobial. So it's really good if your grapes have any 
any rot or anything wrong with them, you, you, you put that in. You actually, you can put it in with the must. You can do it after you're done fermenting. And it's a, it's a, um, essentially it kills bacteria, but it's, uh, it's made from the shells of a certain type of shrimp. Okay. Uh, and so what it is, you put it in there and it will, uh, after about three or four days, it precipitates out. You rack the wine off and now you have a wine that doesn't have any bacteria in it. And so that's really pretty good because you're not actually having to sterile filter it. Um, in fact, last year, as a good example, last year we had you know, early rains and our, um, our Pinot Gris and our Chardonnay, the grapes were just terrible. And I looked at them and I went, oh man, there was a lot of oxidation, there was a lot of damage you know, from the rain. And I thought, oh, we're just going to make terrible wine this year. And I thought, oh, this is not going to be good. I thought, well, you got to do the best you can. And so you know, I, I crushed and destemmed and pressed it. And then I mixed the Cheeto Sand with that, uh, essentially that grape juice, let it settle after four days, racked it off, fermented it. And probably this, um, the 2017 probably is our best Pinot Gris ever. And I kind of went, oh, it could have had all these horrible off you know, flavors and everything because of the quality of the grapes. And I went, wow. This stuff's pretty good. <laughs> so anyway, there's a lot of winemakers don't know about it, yeah. uh, you know, and um, and it's not too terribly expensive. And so it's just little things like that that I've learned and I've picked up over the years that I'm, you know, um, always wanting to learn more. There's always new things that, you know, some of the things I don't really like, you know, that you could do. You like um, I learned that you that um, with. Um, uh, we actually make our wine and age it in uh, flex tanks, which are a, a type of um, uh, a plastic that's uh, made specifically for wine that doesn't impart any flavor to the wine, but it has the oxygen permeability of two-year-old oak barrels. And so you get the, the slow oxidation that you get in an oak barrel um, without the oak. And if you want oak, then you put oak chips in it and then you get your oak. Well, there's some studies that have been done to figure out how much oxygen is permeable through that oak barrel and they've been able to qualify. Now there's equipment that you can buy. If you have a big vat of wine, you can put this in and it will slowly uh, put just a small amount of oxygen in the wine to mimic aging the oak barrel. You know, like we'd get in an oak barrel. And I sort of go, well, I'm not really into that. Uh, maybe a big winemaker, um, a big winery probably would be mm -hmm. um, because, um, you know, the cost of oak barrels are so expensive. They figure it adds about $20 a gallon. Um, you know, to the cost of your your wine if you use oak, uh, because, uh, oak barrels because they're you know five hundred to fifteen hundred dollars a barrel. So with these flex tanks, um, they're around three fifty or four hundred dollars a piece, and I like them because I can use them over and over and over again. You can pressure wash and get them really clean, and so uh, they they work really good for us. And a lot of winemakers don't know about it. I think more and more winemakers are finding out about it, um, and so it's not as romantic as using oak barrels, but um, it's it works for us. Sure. So let's talk a little bit about your sort of pre-wine uh, growing uh, mm -hmm. growing stuff. Uh, you are obviously you have, you have talking about gardens and mm -hmm. Bonnie, tell us about the, the rare plant research nursery and kind of the, you, you, the, the, the impetus behind that. Sure, well it actually started back when I was in graduate school. I mean that's the, the early seeds uh, of it. Um, I was in graduate school down in California. I started, be, I started to become a clinical psychologist and I went out uh, one day to this little bonsai nursery out east of town and um, just fell in love with with the trees mm -hmm. and there was this Japanese lady there she would be working on these trees and I felt so good there it was exactly the opposite of what happens when you're in graduate school and um, and I went wow wouldn't it be neat to be able to have a life doing that you know well so I got me motivated I started um, making bonsai growing bonsai mm -hmm. and so I did that for a number of years and then um, I went to Southern California once and um, it was this would have been in the um, oh, probably the mid to late 80s and I visited some nurseries down there this was um, in the winter time between uh, Christmas and New Year's and I found a couple of specialty nurseries that specialize in what are called caduciforms. And they um, are a plant that naturally develops a thickened trunk or a big tuber, that sort of thing. So it's sort of uh, tangentially related to bonsai. 
And so I went, wow, these are really cool plants. And so I bought a few and then I started learning how to propagate. And then pretty soon I started having more. Uh, and then I went, what am I going to do with these? And this was long before the internet. And so I made a little list and I started sending out a mailing to, to people I thought would be interested. And then about that time, I also started traveling mostly to Mexico, uh, but to, uh, eventually to other parts of the world looking for new plants. And so during that time, um, I uh, met a botanist from Mexico and spent a lot of time in really remote areas of Mexico, probably visited there, I don't know, 20 or 30 times. Um, and we, uh, and, I, and I started writing journal articles for scientific magazines, stuff like that. And um, I actually got a patent on one plant, um, discovered a couple of plants new to science, uh, did some ethnobotanical articles, uh, and a lot of stuff in, in the plant world. And, um, and the, then the nursery just grew and grew until finally it was making more money than my psychology practice. And so, you know, it was about, you know, five or years after that, I thought, well, you know, my clients are doing really good now. I'm going to say goodbye and focus on the nursery, which is what I did. And then 9-11 um, came and, um, and it really changed how difficult it was to move plant material between countries. Sure. Up until that time, I had a lot of customers in Japan and Europe, and then that really started to dry up. I, I really specialize in propagating a lot of endangered species. Um, and so um, my idea was, um, uh, there's a, there's a quite a black market for some uh, plants that are really endangered and people will find ways to go and dig them up in the wild even though uh, it could be a $25,000 fine they still will do it mm -hmm. uh, and so my idea was to raise them from seed or from cuttings and uh, essentially undercut that black market and so that was part of my goal I mean I really love the plants but there was a little bit of altruism uh, in there in in the business so um, so that's what happened and then after 9-11 I started focusing more on plants for gardens and then um, and started doing more in terms of what people would grow in their garden or maybe in a container. I still do some of those really rare plants, uh, but not, not very many. And so now, uh, then we became a wholesale nursery and started selling to different um, gardens, uh, garden centers, you know, between um, Eugene and Seattle. Mm -hmm. uh, but now we're, we're, we're kind of slowing down. I'm not getting any younger. <laughs> and so it's a lot of work. And so now we sell to like, we just used to sell to like 80 nurseries now. It's about 10 or 15. Um, and then we're open a couple times a year um, to the public. And the biggest one is in uh, May. It's the, the third weekend in uh, May. And we'll have 1,500 to 2,000 people show up for those two days. Uh, so it's really popular. That's amazing. <laughs> so, uh, so that's kind of that. And, and part of what we uh, have hoped that hasn't really materialized is that people would come taste wine, be inspired by the gardens, and then go and maybe start, take up gardening, or maybe expand their garden, or mm -hmm. take, but it doesn't seem to have worked that way. So what we've found is there's a lot of gardeners that drink wine, but there are not many wine drinkers that garden. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, and I think sometimes people come here and maybe they don't um, see how maybe they could, this is a pretty big garden, uh, and maybe they don't see how they could use maybe a part of what we've done and, and run it through their own psyche to come up with their own version uh, you know, of something. So, um, so it, that hasn't happened that we wished it would have happened, but so far we haven't really noticed it inspiring people to garden more. Now, the, the gardeners that come here, it inspires them, but the people that aren't gardeners doesn't seem to, they just come here and enjoy it. <laughs> That's amazing. When you started growing grapes, were there any unforeseen challenges? Obviously, you had grown all of these things. You had all this knowledge. Was there anything special about growing grapes? Well, grapes are, are real. They're, as, and, it, and it comes to plants, they're real thugs. I mean, it's, um, they're really as bad as the Himalaya blackberry. I mean, in terms of, of growing. Now, they don't seed themselves like the Himalaya blackberry does. but you just stick a cutting in the ground and it will root. Uh, I mean, it's better if you, you know, do it in a, in a nursery where you can control the conditions a little bit better. So actually starting the, 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 the vineyard was really pretty easy because I had all this experience with plants that are a lot harder to propagate than, um, uh, than, mm -hmm. than grapes are. Uh, so I didn't graft the grapes, so I put them on their own roots. So I know someday that phylloxera is probably gonna get in there and we're gonna have a problem. But, um, but so far, um, you know, we're doing fine. Mm -hmm. And plus, we didn't have any money in the beginning, too, and so we got um, cuttings from our neighbor after they'd trimmed their vines in the, in the winter, and I just rooted them, and boom, then we planted them out a, a year and a half later, and now we have a vineyard. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Uh, have you have you developed uh, like a winemaking or philosophy in your time making wine? I know you haven't made it for many years, mm -hmm. but do you have like a winemaking philosophy? Well, um, I'm always trying to make wine better, mm -hmm. um, and so. Um, so, so for, for what, what I'm trying to do with a Pinot, uh, for instance, um, I want a fair amount of fruit. So when you taste it, you definitely taste fruit. But I'm also wanting to get some of those earthy tones that you get in a really, really good Pinot Noir. And I'm, I've gotten a little in that direction, but not as much as I would like. Um, years ago, actually when I first visited France back in 1976, um, I was into wine and um, I visited uh, Burgundy and went wine tasting. I found this little place in Beaune, it was called uh, Marché au Vin, and it was, um, it was a wine tasting place that was in um, uh, an old, um, very small Gothic church with a basement. And for two dollars, you would go down and taste 40 wines, and you just pour them yourself. And so, you know, the little spittoons so you could spit and so forth. And so I went down, I started tasting all these wines. And I got to Chambertin, which is, of course, one of the better um, uh, French uh, Burgundies. And I thought, you know, these were like, in those days, these were like $30 a bottle, which nowadays would be like $150 a bottle. Um, and I tasted one of those, and I went, Oh, this is completely different than anything I've ever had. This is amazing. And so that's been my goal ever since, and I'm not even close. <laughs> um, so it's um, so that's what I would like to do for a Pinot. Um, and I, you know, I'm trying to make you know a, a several layers of flavor. So you maybe you have a really nice bouquet that gives you sort of the anticipation of what you're going to taste. Then you taste and you get the the fruit forward uh, part, and then you get maybe the middle where there's some nice um, you know maybe earthy tones, and then at the end you get a nice finish. You know, a nice smooth finish, not a lot of heavy tannins and that sort of thing. Um, that's what I'm looking forward to trying to make a Pinot. And with like Cabernet, for instance, it's a little bit different. Um, I'm looking for, you know, a fair amount of fruit, but again, more layers and um, a lot more tannin in the finish. Uh, not, not so much that it's, it's um, really harsh. In fact, we didn't bottle our 2013 until um, just last fall because the, han the tannins were so, uh, so harsh in it. And of course, as you know, as you age wine, the tannins break down and it becomes more mellow when you get these interesting flavors and that sort of thing. Sure. So, um, so that's kind of what I'm doing for that. Now, when it comes to Pinot Gris and our Grenache Rosé, it's all about the fruit. And so those wines, I want lots of fruit. Doesn't have to have a whole lot of complexity. Just, I mean, it would, if it was complex, it would be great, but I'm really going for fruit. So um, our Grenache Rosé, you know, we call our summer picnic wine. You have it like on a picnic, you go, oh, I'll have a glass of wine. You go, oh, wow, this is really good. I think I'm gonna have another one. You know, and you're eating a sandwich or a barbecue or whatever, and it's, uh, and it's real informal. And um, it's kind of like the, uh, the equivalent of the French attitude towards, um, um, uh, Beaujolais Nouvelle, Nouveau, excuse me. Um, and so, you know, it's it's something that you drink for the fruit. It, you don't drink for to savor the the complex flavors. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of my winemaking philosophy. And you know, I'm always trying to learn, you know, ways about how I can do that better. And you know, and that's there's never any end to that. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. So I'm curious when you, if you can sort of compare like your impressions of the Oregon wine industry before you joined it to, to mm -hmm. now, like what has changed in your impression of the industry? What, do you, what are your thoughts on the industry? Mm -hmm. Well, back when I was in graduate school, which would have been in the um, uh, mid to late 70s, um, the, um, there started to be more um, uh, interest in Oregon wine. And a friend of mine says, hey, we ought to go wine tasting. I went, wine tasting in Oregon? Really? What? You know? And so we went out and wine, wine tasting. And uh, this was back in, this would have been probably 76 or 77. And we tasted a lot of wine. And I didn't think any of them were very good. I mean, it was just like, mm, I'll take my French wines, you know. And actually, I became, by that time, by in the mid to late 70s, I became sort of a French wine snob, you know. And I'm glad I'm not that way anymore, thank God. My wife would have divorced me. But, um, and, and, but, um, and for a long time, I thought the only good wines came from France. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, until I started tasting some Riojas from Spain and a few other things, it was like, oh, there are some good wines besides France. Well, back then in the um, late 70s, I was still in graduate school, 
went wine tasting again, and it was like, oh, there's some wines that are actually pretty good here, you know? And so then I moved back to, to Oregon uh, in 81, and I met um, a fellow that was growing grapes out near our family farm. <clears throat> and so, I, you know, we started talking, a really nice guy, and, um, and he was making wine, and, um, and I think he was selling some grapes too. And so we had our family farm, and oh, I'm going to plant some grapes on the family farm. And so I got some cuttings from him, planted some Pinot Noir, and, uh, and then I was busy. By that time, I was um, a clinical psychologist, really busy, didn't have time to, to take care of them, and eventually they just weeds grew up around them and they never mm -hmm. did anything with it. But that was my first introduction, but I really liked the idea of, of growing your own grapes and making your own wine but it was kind of a um a dream but just something i thought would never happen um and so uh, so then when i um um uh you know of course then there's uh, the Oregon wines, you know, got a lot of notoriety for having good Pinots, and so um, uh, then, you know, I started taking Oregon wine a lot more seriously. Uh, and of course, now it's becoming world renowned. So, you know, <clears throat> uh, but I think now, after having made wine, it really changed my um, perspective on. Um, uh, on wine and what I know about wine. I know a lot more about wine other than just the taste and reading about something in a book about how you know it was made, that sort of thing. Sure. Um, and to be honest with you, I think um, um, a lot of Oregon Pinots, I really shouldn't say this, I know, but I don't think are that good. I mean, they're, um, I shouldn't say that, they're okay. But they're, my experience, actually not only in Oregon, but all over the world, there aren't very many wines that are great. They just go, oh, this is amazing. I mean, and that's what you want, right? I remember years ago, actually when I was in graduate school, I went to a, a Hoiblein a wine tasting in San Francisco. I, I was a poor student. It cost $10 to go. It was in the Fairmont Hotel in downtown San Francisco. And I was able to taste 100, 200 year old bottles of wine. Uh, and I remember one, um, wine it was a dessert wine from austria and it was um it was of course very sweet the glass i held the glass this far away you could smell the bouquet from there and it was absolutely to die for by the time you got it to your nose you didn't even have to drink it it was so incredible then you then you tasted it, it was like uh, well that was what 40 years ago and i still remember that wine you know and i remember that chambertin i told you about when i was in, yeah. in france and so there are a few wines that that are that way that you just sort of go oh and i think that's a lot of winemakers goal and it's just how do you get there i mean sometimes it's just luck i mean you do everything you can to make that great wine and then the rest of it is luck <laughs> you know i mean it's just maybe it didn't rain enough that or too much that year or there's a whole bunch of things that go into it sure. you know um and so um so um i know our wine our, our pinot noir that we make is a little bit different than a lot of organ pinots because we have a little more fruit in our wine so i like to pick the grapes at you know like a, a bricks of 25 maybe mm -hmm. We had one year that were bricks of 27, uh, which is kind of unheard of for, for Pinot. Um, but typically it's, you know, 24 to, you know, 25 and a half is, and, uh, and, you know, this last year, uh, you know, we had that early fall rains and our Pinot Noir looks like rosé. <laughs> so it's like, ah, it's not the kind of wine I want to make. So anyway, but what can you do? That's the way the weather was. And so, you know, um, so that's kind of my opinion a little bit about what's happening in, uh, in Oregon. Um, and I think um, more and more people, at least on the, on the east side of I-5 here, where I belong to uh, um, an organization called um, Cascade uh, Foothill Wine Growers. And there are only about, I don't know, a dozen or a little bit more uh, of us that grow grapes and, and, um, and have wineries on the uh, east side of I-5. Um, but there are a lot of people there that are raising other grapes besides Pinot and uh, Noir and Pinot Gris. Um, and I think that is really interesting because, um, you know, really Oregon uh, wine industry is in its infancy. I mean, if you think about the French, how long they've been growing grapes on the same vineyard for hundreds and hundreds of years. And they, you know, they have all this experience over all kinds of different, um, you know, weather through different seasons and so forth. And you know that this particular grape and this particular soil is the best, you know. And Oregon, we have a long ways to, 
to go until we we have the, that many years or that many seasons of experience to really know you know um, um, you know what makes um, what kind of soil and what kind of uh, you know climatic conditions really make a, a really great uh, pinot. I know that a lot of um, people you know they go hey this 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 ground looks like it would be good for for grapes and so you know you put it in a vineyard and and it costs a fortune to do it and, and then you make the wine and it's just like just okay well you don't just rip out the vines and go well this wasn't good soil sorry no you keep making the wine and so you have okay wine but you don't have great wine you know and so um but to me the great wine is the goal sure, <laughs> you know sure. so um i mean because it's like um my wife and i we we have wine with dinner not every night but almost and it's like you know you have a glass of wine with dinner and it just makes the dinner just a little bit better. And if you have a really good wine with dinner, it makes the dinner a great dinner. And that's really, you know, what I think it's all about. In fact, we have a, um, a little motto here. Um, we have, because we garden a lot, we, we say, um, find food, find wine with friends in the garden. And that's sort of the motto here that, that we kind of, um, uh, we live by, I guess, you know. It's one of the things that we really enjoy. What are you looking for when you're sourcing grapes from a vineyard? What are, what are you looking for? What characteristics of the vineyard or the grape are you looking for? Well, I'm looking for um, uh, grapes that are grown really well. Um, I'm not necessarily looking for organic or biodynamic, um, although I've been learning about a biodynamic, um, uh, and I'm if initially I thought, oh, this is just some voodoo thing. <laughs> now I'm starting to go, hmm, maybe there's something to this, but I'm not real. I'm not convinced yet, you know. Um, but um, uh, but uh, so I'm not really looking for organic, or, but I'm just looking for really good grapes. And really, the only way to really know for sure is to make wine from the grapes. Mm -hmm. um, and assuming that it's a decent year, then you have a pretty good idea if it's what it's gonna what it's gonna be. And then you know you may want to modify your uh, if you think you can make really good wine from that, then you I modify my. Um, you know what I'm doing like for instance with the Grenache Rosé the first time I made it um, I just um, um, you know uh, crushed and destemmed and pressed it and fermented it and it was really really pale pink and it had good flavor but the second year I thought you know I'm gonna leave it on the skins for I think like three or four hours and get a little bit more color a little bit more flavor and I did that and was like oh this is so much better and so you know, you, 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 know, you kind of adjust to the vineyard if you really think those grapes are what you're looking for then you can alter your your winemaking technique a little bit, um, uh, you know, to to make it a little bit more what you want. And you know, I, I used to think that the winemakers. Um what he did to the wine or she did to the wine was not that important. Uh, but then um, I mentioned uh, Chris Carlberg, who um, we got some grapes from um, initially. Well, then, I don't know, three or four years ago, we bought some um, Pinot Gris from him. And um, same vineyard, um, same year, everything. I thought, oh, the, our Pinots are going to taste really similar. So we tasted his, he tasted ours, completely different. You would never guess they were even in the same same vineyard mm -hmm. and the same year. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what the winemaker does really does matter is what I'm getting at. <laughs> <laughs> so you and I have talked a bit before about sort of Oregon wine history mm -hmm. and your interest in it. Uh, tell me a little bit about your the developing development of interest and in, in sort of the projects you were thinking about working on with that. Sure. Um, well, actually, one of the things that I'm really interested in, and I really haven't got off the ground with it, um, years ago, um, when we were first building this, we um, went to uh, Mexico to, right along the border, um, to a little town called Tecate, where they make um, um, roof tiles. And so we wanted handmade roof tiles for this building that we, we built. And so we went down there to see if they would fire them to a higher temperature. Um, that would withstand our freeze thaw conditions. Well, they nobody was interested in doing that. But a friend of ours who owned a wine distributorship up in Seattle had told us that there's this area called Valle de Guadalupe, just south of um, of the border. I don't know, uh, 20, 30 miles that north of Ensenada, that uh, there it's a Mexican wine growing area. Mm -hmm. And so we sort of went. And I went, Bert, really? Mexican wine? Really? He goes, well, the wines aren't very good now, but they're on a path to being good. Mm -hmm. and so this was back in, um, probably it would have been the, the mid-90s. And so when we were down there, it would have been in about 2006, we tasted, we, so we went to the, to, the, to the tile place and so forth, and they weren't interested. So we had this time and said, well, let's, 
you know, we're at, right on the road. Let's drive down to Valle de Guadalupe and taste some wine. And so we did. And so um, we tasted some wine and they weren't very good. And, you know, and then at the end, we were stopping by the side of the road and there was this old couple. They were selling wine in this little, small little building with a, kind of a little shack is what it was. And they had this wine. And we said, oh, well. And they, but they were just selling it. And so we were there and we were talking to them in my best Spanish, which wasn't very good. And finally we thought, oh, we'll buy a bottle of wine from them. And so we bought a bottle of wine. It was $25. And we went, $25, I didn't taste this. Well, this is, I mean, for us, that was expensive wine, especially in those days. And so we, um, uh, this is a long story, sorry about it, but it, uh, there is, a, there is a, um, a point to the end, uh, if I don't forget it before I get there. Um, and so, um, so we brought it home and I forgot about it. And a year or two later, you know, we were having a wine. Oh, let's open this. It's probably not very good. It's just a vin ordinaire kind of dinner. Open this wine. And we couldn't believe how good it was. And we went, oh. So then we went back there to actually taste wine. And that was about two years ago. And we tasted at a number of places. Now they're about, well, and two years ago, there were about 50 winemakers in the valley there. And we went to, um, they have a wine history museum there. And um, the Mexican government spent, I don't know, three or four million dollars um, building this structure that starts with the history of wine back in the Republic of where the Republic of Georgia is now, all the way through Europe as it moved through, uh, you know, through the Middle East and the Rome or to, to Italy and France and Spain, and then eventually, and, and there from their perspective, then to Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, and they started making wine in Mexico back when it, you know it was first settled by the Spaniards, mm -hmm. so back in the 1500s. Um, so it was a long, long time of history, but most of the wine wasn't very good, and most of Mexico can't raise good wine because it's too tropical. You know, the vines need to be able to go dormant and stuff like that. Um, well, so walking through this wine history museum, they had a lot of, um, of videos. They had, you know, um, um, uh, examples of like old wine presses, mm -hmm. how they make corks. They had bark, um, uh, big chunks of bark from the cork oak um, tree and, um, and how they make corks and all this, plus a number of videos that you could watch. And then, then if you wanted to, you could do wine tasting. And it overlooked uh, this beautiful view of vineyards in the background and the valley. You could see the valley across the way. And I went, wow. This is what Oregon needs. Because by the time you got out of there, you really want to taste wine. And plus you have an advanced history of wine. Like before that, I didn't know that wine started in the Republic of Georgia. I think it started about 8,000 years ago. You know, and the reason they found it is because I realized it, that they found these big um, uh, earthenware terracotta pots that were buried in the ground. And as it, um, you know, we get a flood or something, it would erode, these things were showing up. And that's, they figured out that that was why uh, and so anyway so what my, what I would like to do and I've talked to a few people and then I get busy and I don't have time to follow it up but I've talked to a few people about maybe doing something like that here and I thought the perfect site for it would be the um, the Blue Heron paper mill site overlooking Willamette Falls because it's the second largest waterfall in the in the United States and I thought you know you could do something like that you could have um, uh, you know, a large uh, banquet room uh, and a commercial kitchen. You could have, um, um, you know, chefs could rent it to do special wine pairing dinners. You could do seminars there. Plus, you would have all the things um, talking about wine history back from the time of Georgia up until until um, Oregon and tell Oregon's story about about history. And to me, it would be a great place for everybody, but especially people from out of state, mm -hmm. to come to get oriented towards Oregon wine. So, you know, most people fly into Portland, so Oregon City is pretty close. The, you know, the Willamette Falls would attract people that aren't into wine. You know, the spouses who are not, don't want to drink wine, but they want to see the falls, they want to walk along the, the trail that's going to be built there. And so they, you know, they can see this, and then they can have, um, you know, they can have wine tasting there if they wanted, but there'd be maps, they would be um, describing the different area, different AVAs, uh, you know. And so people would go, and they would go, oh, well, I think we want to go to Eola Hills, or I want to go to the Dundee Hills, or, or you know, and they would have a really good sense of where, a, 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 a real good orientation, I guess. Because when you like, even when you go to Napa and Sonoma, there's nothing like that. Mm -hmm. You know, so you go wine tasting, and you just sort of, unless you do a lot of research beforehand, 
you're just sort of going, well, here's a wine, let's stop here. And you have no idea if they're going to be wines that you like or they even grow the kind of grapes that you like, you know. And so, anyway, that's my idea. But so far, the, the, um, it's been really slow with the... Um, with the development of a blue heron site and who knows if it's ever going to get developed but anyway so um so i'm keeping that on the back burner and uh maybe find somebody with a lot of money someday that wants to you know, put some seed money to get it started <laughs> be an amazing project yeah it would be it would be you know probably cost five million dollars you know um, I mean, i'm guessing depends on you know how fancy you made it and that sort of thing but it could be something i think if you could rent it out you know a, a part of it for events it could be something that maybe could be self-sustaining so it wouldn't require a big endowment to keep it going you know sure. otherwise then it becomes a big you know money pit sure. you know sure. but um so anyway that's kind of one of the things I would like to see happen. <laughs> it's right up our alley, of course. That'd yeah. Be great. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about here and mm -hmm. sort of what you see happening in the future, say the next five, ten years here at Villa Catalana. Well, um, mostly doing what we're doing right now. Um, we uh, we do a few weddings now. We um, we we want to do fewer and fewer weddings, and we do about a half a dozen a year. Um, we're interested and in more in doing um, uh, more events where people. Um, can really appreciate the the setting and the wine and the food. Um, wine, I went, uh, excuse me. Um, uh, weddings, we've had enough of them. They're sort of predictable. People come and you know you have a ceremony and and then the party happens. And by the time um, you know eight o'clock, eight thirty rolls around. Most people have left, and now we have the people that want to drink a lot. And you know, we we close early because we're you know uh, on exclusive farm use. Ha everything has to be over and done with at ten o'clock, mm -hmm. and they would like to go on until four in the morning. You know, and so there's always this hassle. And then we always have the problem of really monitoring people so they don't drink too much. And it's really not about the wine it's not about appreciating the environment it's about party hardy mm -hmm. and that's not what we're about we want people to come and to have the experience where they can sit and have a glass of wine maybe have uh have uh, dinner or lunch and go you know life isn't that bad <laughs> you know because there are so many things in life that are that bad you know and so um, um, and so that's that's what we want to continue to develop and so we keep adding things to the garden uh, we just walked past it but I put in a, a new um, um, uh, sort of raised bed area for more seating and I put in a fountain and a pizza oven, wood fire pizza oven. And so that eventually we'll do, you know, a few pizzas. Um, we found out from um, the ODA regulator that we actually can do wood fired pizzas here, you know. Uh, and so there's just little things that we do now. All the major construction pretty much is, is done, you know. So, but there are little tweaks here and there that, that we do. But the main goal is um, to provide a place where people can be inspired and again relax and go you know life isn't that bad and just be able to enjoy themselves and go home with maybe a little bit of um, of what we've done here in their heart mm -hmm. and so our, when we before we started um, um, uh, making wine, or when we started talking about doing a winery, I said, you know, it's going to be really critical that we have a place that people really like because there are so many wineries. Who's going to come to another small little winery that's doing what everybody else is doing? And so, um, and that's in fact what's happened. Um, people come here and they find out that our wines are actually pretty good. They're coming here mostly because they've seen a picture on the internet <laughs> or some friends have told them about most of, we don't advertise, most of our, um, our, um, our customers come from word of mouth. And so, um, so, uh, so they come and then they, our goal is they buy a bottle of wine, they take it home and maybe it, it's, who knows what kind of an occasion they open it. But my hope is when they open that wine, they'll go, oh, Remember when we were in Villa Catalana? Wasn't that a nice experience? And it sort of enhances their own dinner as they're eating, even though they may be living uh, in a you know studio apartment in who knows where in Portland, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, so it's the idea of to bring a higher quality of life to people. It's a very noble goal. Well, it's just. What else is there, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's not about the money anymore, you know? I mean, uh, I mean, once you get to a point where, you know, you're, you're comfortable, um, then you can focus on other things just, be trying, just besides, you know, trying to make a dollar, you sure, know? 
Let's talk about the larger Oregon industry for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you see happening to it in the next, say, decade? Well, I think that um, that more and more um, uh, vineyard owners are going to be planting and experimenting with different varieties. Uh, I think more um, more cool climate varieties. Um, you know, German grapes. Um, you know, uh, northern France Loire um, varieties. Um, I think that um, uh, that like our experience has been here with our local population people are uh, local people are getting tired of Pinot Noir and so I think Oregon winemakers will will branch out into other um, um, other grapes in addition to Pinot Noir and I think Pinot Noir will always be the the flagship grape uh, because um, a good Pinot is hard to beat, <laughs> you know. So, um, but that's what main thing I, I see, you know. And I think you know, there's a lot of um, there's a few I should say um, large um, um, vineyard owners that are moving up from California. And I think there'll be you know a few more really big um, vineyards that do you know, hundred thousand, two hundred thousand cases a year. Um, but um, but I think. The thing about Oregon is this: it's a small vineyards mm -hmm. um, where a person can go and they can they can talk to the winemaker and say, "Hey, this is how I made this wine. What do you think?" You know, and um, and you can get good feedback from people when you do that. But I think that's what people want. In fact, we had a couple here come uh, who used to live in California. They moved to Oregon and they said, "You know, we are." Um, we don't go to Napa and Sonoma anymore. We're tired of the California wine scene. We want to be able to come to a place and talk to the winemaker, talk to about their philosophy of wine. And they said, but you know, it's changing here. Oregon is starting to become like California and that you don't get to talk to the winemaker. Because once you get very big, then, well, the winemaker is busy making wine. He doesn't have time to talk to people in the tasting room, you know? And so that I see as a, as a potential um, a problem, I think, uh, for those people that really want to have a personal wine experience. Um, sure. So that's kind of what I see is is happening with with Oregon. You know, more varietals and um, and you know again small wineries being the main emphasis. But there's going to be some really big ones come in because a lot of people don't go wine tasting. They want to go to the grocery store and buy a bottle of wine and go home and it, drink it, and they want to have a, a decent wine. You know, and we need that. <laughs> With the, the growth of number of wineries, number of vineyards over the last five, ten years, do you see that continuing? Do you see us adding 50 to 75 new wineries every year for the foreseeable future? You know, I don't see how we can do that unless people, there's a lot of wine that gets exported because there are only so many people in Oregon and then there are only so many, um, you know, out of state visitors um, that eventually I think it will be, and, and in some respects it already is. Um, Pretty gets pretty competitive until um, uh, you know there's a fight for people that want to go taste wine and and there's some wineries that aren't going to have the draw that are going to fold or they're going to sell their vineyards to to you know a really large conglomerate or something like that. Um, so I see that that uh, even though on my experience with the Cascade Foothill Wine Growers Group, we're, we're not in competition with each other and we send people to each other and that sort of thing, you know. Uh, you know, someone will come to the tasting room and say, hey, are you going to do any more wine tasting? We recommend our neighbor or somebody, you know. Um, but I think, um, uh, especially where there are a lot of wineries, it becomes harder and harder for uh, a small winery to differentiate itself from everybody else. Now we've done it here with our gardens and our, our you know, 12th century inspired you know, stone buildings. You know? <laughs> so that's a little different and a lot of people, a lot of wine, wineries don't, won't do something like this um, that, that's, that's pretty unique um, or won't know how to do it or it'll cost too much money or whatever. But, but you know, I think more, there's going to be more and more wineries in Oregon that start to become like Napa Valley where there are, you know, you can spend $50 million on a winery. And, you know, as, as more money comes to Oregon, you know, that's going to happen. And, and I think there's a place for that, you know. Um, we, uh, my wife and I go to a Napa usually every year and you you just never know what you're going to find and uh, we've met a guy down there that is drilling all these um, um, caves into the side of a, a hillside and he's like importing all these workers from Italy and he's doing all this Italian stuff. He's probably spent at least 50 million dollars on his, he's got two wineries now and it's like it's amazing to go there and, and visit but um, but it's not what Oregon's about, at least not at this point, you know. And it sort of becomes a little bit Disneyland-esque, you know. It's like, well, do you really want that? Well, for some people, yeah, but 
maybe not for most people, you know, so. Sure. What advice would you have for someone who wanted to enter the wine industry today? Oh, wow. Um, probably um, really be sure that you really want to do this <laughs> and um, that you make sure that you have a real passion for it and also that you're not afraid of hard work. Um, and that it's going to take a lot and also to um, come up with an idea that will differentiate yourself from the other five or six hundred wineries in, in Oregon mm -hmm. because if you don't it, you won't make it mm -hmm. you know there's just they're just not going to get the people to come so you, you you and I think personally I think it takes more than just making really good wine to attract people. I mean, eventually the word gets out that you make really good wine and that will certainly bring a lot of people. But if you have a, a place that people can come that they really enjoy, now they're getting two things for the price of one, you might say. Um, I know there are some vineyards uh, or some wineries now in Oregon that don't allow groups of over eight people and they don't allow you to bring food. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, if that works for them, that's great. Um, for us, that's not what we're about. I mean, that's a lot easier to do. It's a lot less hassle than people coming and bringing food and then leaving their trash and you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, but I think um, the average Oregon wine taster really wants to have an experience, not just, it's, not, it's more than just about the wine. Sure. Um, so that's what I would uh, uh, recommend if someone's interested in getting into, into the business at this point. So that's all the questions that I have ah. for you. Uh, is there anything else I should have asked? Anything else you'd like to mention here? That, oh my, uh, I, think, I think that's about it. I don't know. <laughs> I'm talked out, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. All your thoughts and opinions and stories.